in order to move forward, we, we, we have to understand where we come from. And as I said, you're going to make the same mistakes. So, so they say, you must learn from your mistakes. Ne? You must learn. You must learn from your mistakes. Ne? So part of looking back is to say, so what mistakes did we make? And to, to answer that question, we must, unfortunately, we must go and scratch a little bit, like uh, in, a, in a scratch patch thing where you look for that gemstone. So, so I'm going to do a short little exercise on scratching ne? around the 1838 scratch patch. Because it, the, the, the Battle of Blood River didn't fall out of the sky. It happened at a particular point in time, with a particular set of circumstances, and it was that to start. We must try and understand that. So let me give you a quick sketch. Now, do some marketing for my book here, I suppose. So these two books, volume one and volume two, called Bastards or Humans, is a toolkit. If you want to use an industrial image, or if you want to use a medical image, it is a, it's an instrument of healing. It's medicine to heal a broken soul. So volume one, is a story that is called The Unspoken Heritage of Colored People. This is also a contentious term. Because colored people were called by all sorts of names. Ne? Coloreds, Hottentots, Khoi, San, I mean, you name it. But that's the group of people we're talking about, which the Dutch discovered when they arrived here. And the Dutch first called them the Mensa van die Kaap, the Kaap Mans. This was the Dutch word for the Kapenaars is what we call them today. <laughs> Although it means something different today. So the people of the Cape, that's what it was. Geographically uh, uh, described and located. Okay. So we're back to 1838. So this, oh, sorry, so that's volume one. Who are those people? Volume two, what I have in front of me here, is a photo album of 500 years of history. So if you open the page, you'll see a picture. But the picture is a picture in words. Yeah? So I paint the picture in words for every year of a 500 year period of time. And that 500 years, we take it from when Bartholomew Diaz excuse me, arrived in 1488 um, off the shores of Mossel Bay and he, he encountered people living there and he described those people in terms of the color of their skin. You see, they were darker skinned people. They had short curly hair and what's important, they had cattle for as far as the eye can see. In other words, these are wealthy people. These are the Arama men. These are not poverty-stricken people. Wow. Okay. That was Bartholomew Diaz, the Portuguese explorer, describing the people whom he saw in Mossel Bay. Now, I'm sure you've never heard that description of the people in Mossel Bay. But go read what Diaz said. Okay. Now, what I do is, I do a snapshot every year for 500 years, I tell you a story what happened that year. I took a bit of research and so on. And so this is a 500 page book because it's one page per year. And that's how we get to 500 years of history. But I don't call it history. I call it 500 years of intimacy. Because our story, our history, yes, there's a lot of blood and a lot of war but there's a lot of intimacy. Because when the Dutch came here, a lot of these young Dutch men came here, they were single, and they married our local women. If they didn't marry, they lived with them, had children with them, um, and that's how you eventually end up with a population. What do we call these people now? Because they're not Dutch. 
um, just like it. What do we call them? Uh, you got to give them a name. Um, and the name, unfortunately, last eyes. And that's the pain. So this group of people, now reclaiming their name, Koi, San, Krikwa, whatever that name is, comes from that cooking pot where what was in that pot was not desired, it was considered negative. And if we don't strip the negativity out, then we're going to have another 500 years of negative self-image. So that's for another for another another lecture. The point I want to make here is if we go to the way I've written the book, it's chronologically organized. So if you go to, to 1838, which if you have the book then will take you to page 222. I'll tell you the story of the Battle of Blood River and what happened. Don't, I won't repeat the story. But it's always useful, in my view, this is now Reuben Richards speaking, um, to take a 10-year view before and a 10-year view after. Now, what was going on in South Africa 10 years before 1838? So, 1828, then if you want to say my 1848. Okay. Bear in mind here, uh, 1838 is the Blood River. Okay. All right. Battle of Blood River. And this is during the British period. All right. What was the big issue during the British period, slavery. Yeah? And the British were on a mission to abolish, to get rid of slavery. So these are the big enlightened, liberal thinking people. And you had this uh, anti-slavery movement, if you remember the, the name of a Wilberforce, for example. William Wilberforce, who is part of this anti-slavery movement, and they are convincing the British government to abolish slavery. Now, the Dutch, slavery was the name of the game. The Dutch brought slaves from um, Indonesia uh, to Cape Town. That's how we got all the Muslim slaves, which we call the Muslim people today. They were brought in. Um, from Indonesia mainly, um, the African slaves on, of West Africa didn't come down to Cape Town, they went across the ocean to the United States, which is why we have a different experience of slavery in South Africa. Okay? But slavery was on its way out. Now, in 1828, the British government government at the time now in Cape Town, in South Africa, they passed a law. It's called Ordinance 50. Call it Law Number 50 to make it easy. The Law Number 50 said, listen carefully now, everybody is equal. The Hottentot, because by that time the Koi were called Hottentot people, or Hottentotten, was the Dutch word for the Koi and San in Cape Town, Hottentotten. Um, the Hottentotten is equal to the white people. Really? You didn't have to wait for 1994 to be equal. In 1828, we were equal. Well, of course, we were equal when we were born, but that's another discussion. So in law, the British passed this law, Ordinance 50. Ordinance 50 creates a big problem 
because it changes the nature of relationships between the boor, the farmer, and the worker. Now there's a problem. Um, and linked to that whole Ordinance 50 are all sorts of rules that the farmer cannot punish the worker in the way they used to punish them and so forth. In 1832, oh, sorry, 1834, the British Parliament in England now abolished slavery. There may not be slavery as an as a, as a economic system uh, functioning in the British Empire anymore. 1834. Ah, a delegation of white people from South Africa go to the British and they say, listen, man, listen, 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 you don't understand the implications of what you're doing here. Because if, if all these people are no longer slaves, who's going to work on our farms? So we're asking you for four years, eh? four and four, takes you to 1838, just get the picture, Four years to do what we call apprenticeship. Okay. So slavery is abolished, but in South Africa, we want four years of apprenticeship so that we can train up the slaves, the workers, so they can get some skills and then they can look after themselves in the marketplace. That was the thinking. It's like a BEE situation over here. Okay? Four years. That four years takes you to 1838. Keep 1838 is the Battle of Blood River. What else happens in 1834 when slavery is abolished? I have to depend on Ilse now. Well, Ilse didn't do history, so. The Groot. Trek, the great trek, as it is described in history, the Afrikaners trek. And this put it here, the great trek. Okay. I must hasten to add that that wasn't the only trek in the history of South Africa, because the Koyan sand also had a great trek. If you just follow the history of the Griquas, for example. Okay. So the Guru trek happens. Why? Because the Afrikaners, led by Pit Ratif, say, worry so, listen, yeah. These British people, with their liberal thinking, want to come and tell us that these slaves and us are equal. That's not how God intended it to be. Are you getting a feel for? And, and, and they, they, they believe in their understanding of God and the Bible was so strong that they decided they got to pack up and leave because here is the devil is busy here. The thing of equality between races is from the devil. Eh? We're going to pack up and we are going. Now you must have very, very, very strong beliefs if you're going to pack up or also van, eh? with all your worldly possessions and you are going to just march into the hinterland where you don't know what's going to hit you. And all you know, I don't want this equality stuff. This is not what we want. This is not God's plan. So, you know, why are you laughing? No? You never thought of it that way. No? Think about it. That is what drove a great trick. Now, I won't bore you with the, 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 the detail from my books, where I quote from Retief's diary and his manifesto. We, we can do that in, a, in another seminar. But the great trick, as it's referred to, is a group of Afrikaners saddling up their oxen and yihados. And on that journey, 
into the north, towards the north of the country. Remember, they must go from Cape Town, then Graf Renet, then the Eastern Cape, and then through, and you're going up through the middle of the country, and come you by the Oranje Free State, eight, the Orange Free State, you can see that's where they start the Republic, then you go further up north, you get to the Transvaal, they started the Republic. That line starts in 1834. On that journey, they meet Tingan, the Zulu king. And that's where the Battle of Blood River happens. So now you've got the picture. Okay? So it doesn't just happen out of the sky. The remains of us Opat, they were on their way to their version of heaven and freedom and shall we call it democracy and how to live and in their world of how to live white people were superior to black people that's the reality that was their belief system that's what drove them and on that route they meet the zulus you can imagine they win the war against the Zulus. 20,000 Zulus, less than 500 of us, they win the war, God must be on our side. This is confirmation, God is on our side. Not just on our side, but God agrees with what we believe, which is white people are superior to black people. Now, Let's show a bit of empathy and sympathy for the belief system. Because everything around them confirms a view that says, God has rescued us. If we were to lose our battle, okay, on the story. Different picture. But at this stage of the game, everything around them confirmed their theology. And their belief system. All right. Bearing in mind, we are in the British period. The British are the enemy. Because the British says what? Ordinance 50, the Hottentots, the colored people are equal, the slaves are equal to everybody. Here's a slight problem with the British thinking. In uh, 1844, uh, the early 1840s, so the British abolish, let's call it now the, the apartheid that was up here, but then they must bring in a new law to regulate the relationship between people. Because you need a law to regulate the relationships between people. The one law says white people are superior, black people or people of color are inferior. Now when you change it, and you say, white people and people of color are equal. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, our mind tells us that sounds about right. But how do we relate to each other? Ah, the British, this wonderful, enlightened British people have an answer for you, Francina. They pass a law to regulate the relationship between people. And they call the law... I it up to you. The Masters and Servants Law. Or the Masters and Servants Act. Piece of law that says in this society of equal people, <laughs> there are masters and there are servants. Guess who were the masters? And guess who were the servants? I don't think people of color were the masters. I, 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 I don't think so. Okay? See the tongue and kiss. The tongue in cheek here. So this piece of legislation, today in South Africa, we don't call it 
the Masters and Servants Act, guess what it's called? It's called the Labor Relations Act. So this is how you regulate the relationship between an employer, a master, and an employee, a servant. Now what happens when the employer is black and the servant, the employee, is white? I mean, you recall, you know, you need a, you need a bit of a, a mind shift change here. In South Africa today, it is still the case that the majority of masters or employers is what color? And who are the servants? So, 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 huh? Labor relations. Now, one more, one more day. I said to you, 10 years before, Ordinance 50, 10 years after, I'm going to put up a name for you. We won't talk about it in too much detail today, but I'm just going to put up here the Cat River Settlement. Have you ever heard of the Cat River Settlement? The Cat River Settlement? Never heard of it? The Cat River Settlement Mm -hmm. I suppose today we'll call it a, a little mini homeland or something, or, a, or maybe a controversial uh, a mini, uh, what do you call it, Orania? What do you call it? Orania. 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 Uh, 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 kind of an exclusive little area, big area in the Eastern Cape, that was occupied by the Autumtots, also known as Coloreds today. There's an area... It's a group of people who called as their pastor a, a, a former missionary, James Reed. Who was James Reed? James Reed was a young white missionary who came to South Africa in the early 1800s. He was the assistant to uh, Van der Kemp. And fortunately or unfortunately for James Reed, he fell in love with a Khoisan woman, Cape Town woman, and the London Missionary Society wrote him a letter about his marriage to a Francina, you know? And he writes back to his missionary, to his church, his missionary society, and this is what he said. And I quoted it on, on the back cover of, of my book. He says, I have no reason whatsoever to repent of my marriage to a native Khoi woman. Let me just do it slowly. I have no reason to repent of my marriage to a woman of color, the one that used today's language. In other words, his church was asking him to divorce his wife, to repent, to say he's, he's, he's committed a sin in the sight of God. Because that's what you repent for marrying an indigenous woman in South Africa. Then he goes on. I mean, this read was something else. He says, but on the contrary, experience teaches me that I must, in fact, thank and bless God for her. <laughs> Ilsa, this guy... He, was, he must have been on drugs or something. He says, I'm not going to repent of my marriage to this woman of color. This is my last one. And he said, I can see God in her. Don't say that. Because the whole missionary philosophy is that the local people don't have God. And so you must bring God to them. Oh, that's for another discussion. Jan is thinking, Ooh, I can see the seminars. I can see the seminars. But here's the point. This young, this young well, it wasn't young anymore, but this pastor is now called to be the pastor of this group of people who live in the Cat River area.
factor of you. You was God. You will not find much written about that settlement, but let me summarize it for you as follows. The Cat River settlement produced the most educated colored people ever to be produced in the country. They were the most successful farmers ever in the country. And the British government decided they are too successful. We need to take them out, destroy them. And so they destroyed them. The, the strategy initially was through taxation. Reminds me of a good old King Solomon taxing the poor. Uh, in this instance, taxing the settlement. And the settlement eventually falls apart uh, for all sorts of, of, of reasons. That happens 10 years after 1838. Remember, I'm just trying to get a picture 10 years before, 10 years after. What was... What did Angegan, man? If somebody comes to visit you today, 2022, yeah? and I say, man, tell me about your country. Or let's, let, let's make it easier. Um, because now we're writing a history book. Uh, Tabo and Becky um, uh, is in power. And you say, really? So who, who was in power before Tabo and Becky? Oh, no, let me tell you about Mandela. You, you can't understand Tabo and Becky <clears throat> if you don't understand Mandela. Because um, Nelson Mandela was forerunner, and he was followed up by Tabo Mbeki. Okay. Now, and what happened after Tabo Mbeki? Ooh, let me tell you about another guy. His name is Jacob Zuma. You know? I can already see from your faces you've got your own version of history as you tell that story. So, so it's, it's the same in terms of processing the information from the past. Choose a date, and then understand what happened before, and what happened after, and then you make your own mind up as to what assessment you want to make of that piece.